Can you hear me? Yeah, now. Uh, so this evening, um, I'm very glad to welcome Taru Elfing, uh, who's uh, joined us from Finland. And um, she is um, artistic director of the Contemporary Art Archipela Archipelago. It's always a tricky word. Um, and uh, the project, uh, the title of the project is called Archipelagic Logic towards sustainable futures. And um, this is a project that's been underway now for a couple of years. Uh, and um, I'm very happy that Taro was able to come uh, and talk about it uh, with us. And that also um, we are able to participate in the conversation with her um, as uh, also uh, Gediminas and Nameda or Bonus are participants in this project, uh, as am I. And, uh, and so we'll join her in conversation after her presentation. Um, and I'm just going to read uh, the description. Uh, Taro is a, a curator and director, as I said, of Contemporary Art Archipelago. Um, and it calls into play the curatorial notion of the dysfunctional exhibition uh, and its role within the larger concept of sustainability. And we talked a bit about this, about the dysfunctionality of the exhibition itself, and I think we're gonna discuss it further. Um, CAA, a transdisciplinary cross-cultural exhibition, spreads across the aisles of the Turku Archipelago, Baltic Sea, uh, and it included over 23 international artists who researched the area's environment and ways of life and worked with the local community and institutions. And we'll talk more about all of those, about those things. Uh, Elfing will elaborate on the modes of collaboration between artists and curators, the ecolo ecological system as a potential generator of thinking and cultural production, um, and as a site of pilgrimage, as well as the potential of contemporary art as a force in cross-disciplinary research and action. And, uh, and then once she does that, we'll join her and uh, do um, a presentation related to the project in general. So thank you for being here. Um, I also like to mention the upcoming lectures. Um, let's see. Always a feat. Um, okay, so the next lecture will be um, April 2nd, uh, and we'll be joined uh, by, um, with Gloria Sutton. She's going to be joining us, and she's, uh, her talk is called Playback Broadcast Experiments, 1970 and Now, uh, and she's uh, currently a professor uh, at Northeastern University here in Boston. And then on April 9th, um, we are going to have a presentation by Muntadas, uh, who is a professor here uh, in ACT, uh, and um, his title is Projects and Protocols, Conventions on Art and Technology. So yeah, we're looking forward to that talk as well. Uh, and then the last presentation will be on April 23rd, uh, and uh, Michael Ang, uh, who is an assistant professor of philosophy uh, at John Carroll University is going to join us, and he will be um, discussing, uh, the title is Sound and Simio-Capitalism, Affective Labor and the Metaphysics of the Real. So um, I hope you'll come uh, to all of them. So um, I'm going to pass this over to Taro now. Thank you, Taro. Well, thank you, Rene. It's, it's really a fantastic to be here. It's a great opportunity also for us to, um, to talk together, you know, to kind of critically reflect on, on what's been done over the past couple of years and, and, uh, and, and, and kind of, I, I guess, in practice, add to that sort of sustainable practice that we all hope to develop, you know, which has a kind of a longer duration and a sort of space time that is not strictly uh, tied to a exhibition or a project as such. But, um, but I'll, um, I'll try to give you a quite brief introduction to a project that ha is quite you know, large and, and, and complicated. And, um, and it's, we started working on this about six years ago. 
Uh, with the artists we've worked on, we've been, you know, in conversation and actually worked for, you know, at least two years. And um, but I've done the presentation in three minutes once, you know. So uh, I'll t I'll give you, you know, I'll try to be a bit more in depth this time. Uh, but also, it, it's great that I've, um, that Rene and Nomeda and Keriminas are going to talk about their own projects because um, it, it, there's over 20 new projects, and I can only touch really on the surface on these other ones. So um, just to give you a, an idea, uh, this is the kind of map of, of the exhibition. Um, Turku was the European capital of culture uh, that you might know. It's this every year uh, within EU, European Union, there's uh, now there's been two cities every year that has, has, have had this title. And, um, and, and Turku is a quite a small town, but it, it used to be the capital, it's a historical capital of Finland before, um, before all kinds of historical, political, um, colonial reasons. You know, um, Helsinki was built as a capital when Finland became part of Russia 200 years ago. And, uh, and so Turku is a small town, but has a grand history in a way. Uh, from the times of, of, of the Swedish Empire, and, and this archipelago is a, is a region of, of um, about twenty thousand or more islands. Um, so it, it's quite a, a huge area. And if you can see right at the bottom, there's Utter, this little you know the one dot, you know green dot at the bottom. So literally from Turku to get to Utter, it takes you about six hours, uh, two hours on the road, and then four hours on a boat. Um, so that's the kind of scale of the area, so um, totally insane to try to do an exhibition in this kind of a context, as you can imagine. Uh, just to give you a quick idea of, of, of the kind of environment and, and the kind of complexity of, 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 of this environment and challenges, but also potential that it, it, it sort of allows, and why we wanted to do something like this in a, in a place like this. Um, there's a, um, this, um, this region is, is obviously huge, and Historically, it's been very important for the city. And when they, uh, when Turku became the European or got this title, they wanted to really bring in the island somehow to kind of act, you know, to sort of show that Turku is more than the city, but actually this kind of very particular environment is, is a crucial part of that. And, uh, and, and our project that was already being developed, you know, became part of their program. Um, there's a, um, it's a really a beautiful area where there's very few people in the winter, um, but um, huge amounts, like 10 times more or more people who travel around there and spend summers in this area. Um, it's a very fragile ecology. Uh, the Baltic Sea is known to be the most polluted sea in the world um, for various reasons. One key reason being that it, it's a very low salinity. It's a kind of quite nearly enclosed sea. Uh, it's also very, very shallow. And, uh, and of course, there's all kinds of ecological changes that are happening all the time, different species of animals coming and, and, and slight climate changes that are affecting it. And, uh, and, and it's, it's also kind of most, um, I think it's, it's has one of the um, most traffic in, in a sort of a small um, marine area like that, you know, in, in one of those busiest sort of areas in the world. Um, it also has a community, a permanent community that lives in, in quite sort of um, challenging or, or the complex, you know, lives compared to maybe or different to urban lives. This is in the winter, uh, one image from, we've had a couple of really tough winters now. And this is one winter where there's a connection boat coming. Um, and the people actually, they had to, they had to walk two kilometers from the main, you know, from the island on ice uh, to get to the point where the boat could come to because the boat couldn't actually get closer to the harbor because of the ice. And, uh, and there are families who live there all year round as well. Um, the communities are getting smaller. Um, there's often there's an island with one person living on it um, and, uh, and places like this. And, and, and of course, there's a lot of desire to continue living in this sort of these, these traditional ways and, and, and in this different sort of very spread out um, area. Uh, but the infrastructures are getting kind of um, so slowly dismantled. There's, uh, this is a postman on the, on the um, whatever you call this, no scusa. And uh, the postman, the only postman in a quite a wide area now who's left. And he actually used to be a theater director and, uh, and he had enough of the theater world and he moved to one of the islands and became the postman. And, uh, and he's, for example, talked about how crucial it is uh, for this sort of, he's the connection between these people. He goes on like only once or twice a week, uh, but he's the only 
per personal life, human contact for a lot of these people in the winter time, particularly for long periods of time. And so this sense of connections between the islands is really crucial and how these how, how, how these function and how these actually allow for the kind of life in a way to continue on this in this area. Um, there's a lot of traditions, of course, um, and history, um, very sort of historical based. Um, and there's also the military history, as you can see. Um, this is the island of Uta that I'll be talking about on a few occasions. And uh, so this is a kind of like a lot of island locations. There's been very strong military presence, um, but strategically, islands are not important for the military anymore. So, uh, so they've been closing down a lot of those bases. And, and of course, the military presence was also what made these communities sort of survive because there, was, there were enough people living on the islands, enough families to keep the schools open and so on. So when the military has left, there's been a lot of um, changes. And like in Uta, the military only left 10 years ago. And uh, the community has been very active. There's 40 people who live on the island all year round. And the community has been very active in terms of, they still have a school that has, um, uh, last uh, two years ago, there were three pupils in the school. And this year there's eight, uh, nearly a record, because they actually managed to find two families who, to move to the island for to rented houses there. So the community has been away looking for people to come live there. Um, there's, uh, this is, um, you can see Nomeda at the bottom there taking photographs. This is on a pilot boat. Um, so this archipelago area of this collection of islands is apparently one of the most difficult um, marine areas to navigate because it's very, very shallow and very narrow passages with loads of hidden rocks. And, um, and so there's, uh, the pilots are still very important in, in, in guiding the kind of big cargo ships through the area because there's still big ports. There's, for example, a day before this uh, trip where we took the artists, we've taken quite a few of the artists with the pilots. Um, there were 96,000 tons of oil went through this area on one cargo ship. So, so there's this constant um, potential threat as well. And like the military that we talked to said that the biggest uh, threat for the area and the, their biggest role in the area now was actually be prepared for a potential disaster. And, and like he said, that it's not just the oil, but if that amount of Coca-Cola would go in the sea, that would cause the same, same sort of uh, scale of problem. Um, so this kind of, um, going back to that, so this, there's this sort of constant presence of global flows of trade and so on that, that keep on going around these islands. The, the islands are kind of partly unaffected by them, but of course they are still like the people who live on the islands are able to work as pilots and so on and are still connected to these sort of very old traditions as well. Um, and the new, the future now is, is really only way forward for the communities is tourism and, uh, and, and developing nature and also they're looking at the kind of ecological ecotourism and, uh, and, and sort of cultural, uh, potential of cultural activities to kind of revitalize and keep the communities alive. These are bird watchers. Um, there's all year round, bird watchers are there basically all year round because you get on the islands, you get really rare species of birds. There was one day we were very lucky on our press, press trip before the opening. Uh, there happened to be a load of bird watchers on this same boat. And, uh, and then we found out that there had been one bird that is very, very rare in Finland had been spotted on this remote island. And there was about 20, 30 guys who, um, who had basically just you know, driven down from all over Finland that, that night and, um, and were on the boat. And then we witnessed them all run through this, this island to this one shore and stand there and kind of you know, try to find the bird. Um, but there's also other kinds of uh, travel that flows that happen between the islands. These are that maybe we'll touch on later on in the presentation. These are cows going uh, for their summer camp in, a, in one of the remote islands that they take um, cattle to graze on these outer islands. And this re is not for the cow's sake, really, <laughs> but it's actually for the environment's sake. So this is to keep this old. This has been hundreds and hundreds of years that there's been humans living and using you know, and, and farming these islands. So for those very particular ecosystems, it's crucial that this kind of like the cattle grazing keeps on going. Um, so, um, so that was the context that is the archipelago. Then the concept. Um, so when we started working, we were looking at, of course, the kind of ecological issues were really crucial. And, uh, and, and one of the kind of founding kind of um, concepts was this idea of an archipelago, this collection of islands. 
Um, and, um, and this idea that, uh, that what is specific about archipelago and that kind of logic that it has is actually the flows between them, that that's where the kind of, where um, the sort of, in a way, the interesting stuff happens. And this sort of constantly moving uh, matter that connects the islands, that defines the whole of the archipelago, is in a way these connections and flows, and not the kind of particular solid fixed entities as such. Um, in terms of the kind of ecological uh, focus, um, I looked at, you know, and, and, and what was kind of run through the whole project was Felix Guattari's uh, idea of three ecologies. That, um, that there's basically, he suggests that instead of looking at this sort of nature culture binary, we should understand our environment and our world and our existence in it through these three registers that are environment, social, and mental registers that are all intertwined in different ways. So you cannot, for example, in, in terms of looking at green ecological issues, you cannot just look at the environment, but you have to really understand the kind of complex entwinement of these three together. And in our project, what we kind of, you know, simplified this into was this sort of looking at ecology, economy, and aesthetics. And aesthetics with a kind of emphasis on the ethics. Um, and, um, and, and looking at, and we structured a kind of a lecture series that was focused on the local, or sort of a seminar discussion series for the local community, a lecture series in the university in Turku and so on. And this was all kind of part of that process of thinking of, of this site through different kinds of art practices. Um, about the archipelago logic and what that, you know, that also, for us, it's kind of helped us to think about cross-disciplinarity and multidisciplinarity as a kind of, uh, um, as a key to this particular context, to understand and try to somehow address the issues to do with the Baltic Sea or this particular region, uh, we have to have a multidisciplinary approach. We have to understand not just the kind of ecological issues, but not just the kind of marine biology, for example, but also the kind of economics, the political and, 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 um, and, and social histories, culture, culture of the area and so on. And, uh, and so in a way to kind of um, how to start even trying to kind of form the right questions about the future of this site, um, you have to have a multidisciplinary approach. And, uh, and, and in this project, we kind of um, wanted to activate contemporary art as a kind of, or allow it to be a kind of an active catalyst and also participants and mediator in this kind of multidisciplinary uh, work. And uh, why, you know, why contemporary art as, as, you know, to give that sort of a role? Um, this idea of, of um, Irit Rokov, the professor of visual culture, Irit Rokov, she's uh, written about that of contemporary art is one of the only free spaces or free um, sort of platforms that we have in contemporary culture. Um, it's, an, it's, it, it's not defined by a medium, by a form, uh, in, you know, in product uh, space, but actually um, allows for a kind of a space where you can weave connections between very different fields and approaches and modes of practice and so on, and uh, bringing these into contact and into dialogue. And, um, and so this was kind of, um, you know, in that sense, you know, I feel that, you know, the contemporary art can be that sort of medium that connects these different islands in different ways and allows for some kind of a new, new um, understanding knowledge and, uh, and, um, and sort of approaches to emerge from that. Um, another kind of how, where else this sort of archipelago as a concept could be projected on is this uh, the question about the local. And, and, and what is, how do you understand, a, you know, how do you approach a site, a particular site, and the local? And, um, and this kind of how local, what is specific to the local only comes into focus in relation to elsewhere. And, and how the kind of, in a way, the local issues here, for example, are very clearly entwined with global changes, whether they are economic or climate change and so on. And, uh, and so in a way, this sort of dialogue between the local understanding and insight, and actually different approaches that actually bring in those kind of wider perspective and different, you know, from, from different around the, around the globe are really crucial. And, and this also then relates to this idea of site specificity that, um, that um, Rene here has um, written about, uh, site sensitivity, which I think is, is something that really kind of um, fits in with our project as well, that, um, it, it's something that is not focused on the specific or trying to kind of define or capture something specific, but really open up dialogue with the site 
and, and, and sort of open that out in, in different ways. And so in practice, we had, uh, we had involved locally based artists, eight artists who actually live and work in the island, and, and then invited international artists from, from Mexico to, um, to New Delhi, to uh, Croatian islands. Um, to bring in kind of different practices and, and different backgrounds, different perspectives and, and different ways of asking questions, you know, to this site. And, um, and at the same time kind of highlighting in these dialogues the value of the local understanding of the site and that experience, but also the importance of looking and seeing otherwise. And, and, and I think in the, in, the process, in the project in different ways that kind of became apparent that this is, you know, really needed. Um, then the kind of dysfunctionality, you know, trying to, you know, explain briefly and we can go back to that in the discussion of what I mean by dysfunctional. Um, it, it really came from the kind of my uh, you know, apologies in different contexts about the dysfunctionality of our exhibition until I started, somebody points out to me that that's a really interesting kind of way of putting it. And, uh, and, and so I realized maybe I shouldn't be always apologizing, but actually trying to kind of really think, you know, why did we do this in the first place? The, uh, the apology was usually addressed to this kind of, you know, oh, it's so difficult, you know, it's in, in practice, of course, it was very difficult, you know, for, you know, you would need about three to four days to go around and see all the works. Um, so it didn't kind of, it didn't meet the expectations of unused, you know, traditional expectations of an exhibition that you can go and see. With a, with a kind of, you know, you have your afternoon and you can go and see it. And this was not the case. So it kind of required this sort of distance, the physical concrete distances required a different tempo, a different kind of uh, sense of, you know, pace, you know, in, in, in how to engage with the work. And uh, this is just as an example. This is a student from Turku who, who um, participated in the project and ended up collaborating with the National Park people and, and her work is going to be permanent. It's actually on the bottom of the sea in, the, in one of the national park um, sort of um, reserve islands. So you have to go and dive to actually see the work. But the national park um, is, is documenting it and will keep on documenting how it turns slowly into that kind of part of that marine landscape. Apparently this, they were really excited. They told us in the end of the summer that they, they had gone to check it and there were loads of things growing on it already. So, uh, so it's kind of turned into a kind of an experiment as well. Um, there's, um, I guess you could see that in a way the works worked as islands in the exhibition in themselves. They were all quite far from each other. And, um, and so the exhibition as a whole then formed an archipelago. Um, it was not, it's, so it was not definable as a fixed or unified entity. Um, like in, in, in sort of traditional exhibition terms. It lacked kind of thematic focus or that sort of artistic standard that could be seen as a kind of unifying element. Um, but it was actually more like connected by and within this context, this site. Um, so it kind of did something um, that it could be seen as a whole, but actually it was not even meant to be experienced as, a, as, a, as an entity as a whole. Um, but the idea really was that... Um, that was really crucial about this tempo that you have to focus and experience in between the works. Otherwise, the works don't make sense. And uh, because it was really, you know, you had to kind of go and actually experience the archipelago itself to, in order to gain really some sort of something out of the works themselves. But then at the same time, the works kind of became sort of keys into that landscape, the landscape that is quite spectacular in a kind of, you know, we don't have any high mountains, so it's not spectacular in that way, but it's, 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 it's quite grand um, in, in many ways. And, um, and so there was really important for us from the beginning was not to produce, try to compete with that landscape and that views, view in a way, but actually to, uh, to make artwork that is not um, trying to kind of become other spectacles within that, you know, but actually, you know, work in different ways in relation to the environment. And, um, and so we kind of, uh, I see that a lot of the works kind of, they sort of allowed ways into the islands and into kind of, uh, and, and, and ways of understanding this environment and community in, in different ways. And this applies 
also to the local community and not just the visitors, in a way, exhibition visitors. So in terms of the kind of audience, it was, uh, um, it was crucial for us from the beginning to understand the audience is a very, very kind of complex term and entity here. Because of course we had the locals. Um, in the summer there is a lot of visitors and summer residents, but also the locals were involved in different ways for throughout the two, three years of the project. So, so what, is the, what is an audience um, for a project like this? Um, it's also the participants who are involved in the process, um, but also that it's a few viewer, the, the future viewers of, the, of these works that will travel around the globe in different ways. Like you are the audience of the project, you know, as much as maybe people who are participating in the, in the processes in some way. Um, but also the different works had very different audiences. In, you know, in, in very practical terms. So um, there was a process, you know, um, this really, what, what's kind of really crucial here is that there was the one to two year research and production processes for each artist. And, and we were kind of in conversation with the site in different ways and with the artist up to six years. And I can see that this kind of, in a way, this process continues here now, uh, which, is, which is nice. You know, it's nice that things don't end. And, um, and, and in that sense, I also feel that the exhibition was clearly not an end. Um, uh, it did not tie together everything. It did not include even all the works. Um, some works are ongoing. Um, this is, for example, a, a young artist who lives on the islands who produced this whole um, building. Um, it's, a, um, it's a sort of um, like an ecologically built um, structure that you can flat back. And, and take somewhere else and put up. So this kind of a mobile studio um, gallery space that uh, she put up in the middle of nowhere on the islands and uh, spent a month uh, drawing this tree. And um, trying to, and, and then this was kind of presented. And this is obviously something that she will continue working with using this space and also she's been wanting to give it to other artists to work with and so on in the future. We had a platform 9.81 from Croatia they did a project that was also that was visible. There's the map that you can just about see in the, in the, in the space. That was the kind of, they, they um, sort of made an intervention into the map of the area by uh, inserting the Croatian islands as kind of guests into this map and kind of disrupting the kind of usual ways of navigating. But they also, that, they're kind of, uh, beyond that, they did a, a really extensive research project because they've been researching the Croatian islands. And so they kind of reflected on, on this particular context in the Baltic Sea in relation to that. And this was all kind of geared towards the symposium that we had in the end of the summer. So in a way, this sort of their, their, their work was only a tiny bit of the work was kind of visible and tangible in the exhibition, but it's actually research that will be published in other ways. Um, and also, um, we are now working on a book that will make visible a lot of these kind of com more complex processes. Uh, then we'll hear um, later on um, of the uh, Nomeda and Kediminas project, Utopia, um, or Utopia. Um, that is a, it's a process that was public in various stages of the exhibition, uh, but it wasn't like a kind of a work um, that is, it actually developed throughout the exhibition in different ways. Uh, from like workshops to tastings, uh, to visits to an old bunker. Um, and, and Rene's work, um, that in the, uh, in the exhibition we actually showed an existing and earlier work uh, that was really strong, you know, it was all about the questions to do with islands and, uh, and projections across the sea. And, uh, and, and so this was installed in this old potato cellar um, in Uta Island. And, uh, and, and now Rene is working on the new film. So, um, so this, um, so this dysfunctionality, you know, it's something that I, you know, I, I'm happy to talk more about. But really briefly, this idea of being out of order, um, this um, other mode of kind of operation and traditional public art projects, that was that's really been crucial for us to think about, you know, what we're actually doing, what we did, and um, and I think it kind of highlights somehow that we need to really critically rethink what exhibitions can be and what they can do in different contexts. Um, especially the particular challenges and, and potential when we get out of the gallery spaces. But I think the public art in, you know, in the forms that we 
traditionally in council for that. I think that they've come to a large extent to a dead end. And, uh, and of course, there are very different ways of now challenging and finding different modes of, of working with art in public space. Um, but, uh, but this is, I think, this kind of, this dysfunctionality could be an, uh, is, is one way of, of trying to kind of disrupt those traditional sort of frames that we're used to. Um, I'll give you a really quick um, run through some of the works to give you a sense of what, what was you know, going on. And, uh, and then um, I'll wrap up and, and pass on the work to um, Gedimina Sanomera first and then Rene. Um, so um, there was, for example, this is the, uh, Rene Leino is a, lot, a photographer who lived, who's lived on the island for 30 years. Uh, this is the first time that she worked with sound but also the first time that she worked directly with local issues, in a way, issues to do with the, the local context. And, uh, and, and she kind of ended up working with sound because she's found it very difficult to photograph, to actually picture this environment uh, that is kind of oversaturated with quite nostalgic imagery already. Um, and, uh, and she um, collected stories of the wind um, from about 38, I think, people um, who have a strong connection. Either they're local or they have a strong connection to the sea. Um, so from all kinds of people, from fishermen to um, historians to, um, uh, uh, to people who actually work on, on, you know, on ships, you know, in, in different kind of jobs and so on. And, um, and it was um, presented on a local little radio station that covered the first, it was kind of like an entry point into the archipelago, the first ferry that you take. And so this covered a kind of five um, kilometer radius area. So people who were queuing in their cars to the ferry and who were crossing across from the ferry, they could actually tune into this radio station and listen to the, to the wind stories. And, um, and there was, uh, um, and also then it was one of the presentation of the work was in this lighthouse in Utter. And Uta is a, is a site of one of the stories. There's obviously fantastic stories, but one of them is a, is a kind of, you know, just an interesting, quick example. It's an old man, over an 80-year-old man, who's um, lived on this island for nearly always. Her wife is from the island, so she's always been there. And, and he was telling how um, for the last, um, they have always collected driftwood. This island has no trees, practically. They've never had to buy wood to heat their house, you know, for all these dozens of years, or heat their saunas, you know, it's obviously in Finland, everybody does at least once a week. Um, but they've been collecting driftwood. And he said that for the first time uh, last winter, um, they, or last year, they couldn't find hardly any wood, driftwood. And, uh, and so he was just wondering, has the, have the winds changed? And, uh, and when I was doing this presentation about a year ago, before the exhibition, I was, there was a multidisciplinary kind of student audience, and one of them got up afterwards and said that the winds have changed, that for the last two winters, we've had um, the, uh, the uh, sort of, um, you know, where the weather fronts have been coming from a different direction than traditionally. So this idea of actually kind of being able to read your environment and these different changes in the climate and see how this kind of, like, uh, changes that in urban context, we, we hardly... We, we know that it's a strong wind, it's cold wind, you know, but that's about it. Uh, but actually, the kind of how this reflected already climate change and these sort of small changes that are actually happening and affecting people's lives. So they live so closely to the environment that very small changes already can be felt in the everyday. Um, Uta was also a place that uh, triggered Alfredo Jarre um, with his project, Dear Marcus. Um, we took Alfredo to Uta uh, in April 2010, and um, there was hardly anybody anywhere, and it was very cold, and, um, and, and he was asking, where is my audience? Uh, which was obviously a question that we had been kind of thinking about from the beginning, that uh, who is this exhibition for, for various reasons. Of course, thinking about that it's, it, there's no point creating an exhibition in a fragile environment, you know, ecological site, creating an exhibition that will, you know, that will bring, you know, swarms of people driving their cars or muscle boats to see the, uh, the exhibition. Um, so, but his, his question kind of highlights it again, this, that it's also, as a, you know, as an artist, who do you speak to with your work in this sort of context? So on the way back from Uta, we left at 5.45, the ferry left on Monday morning, 
and, uh, and there was nobody else in the boat more than us. So Alfredo was asking again that, you know, why on earth does this boat leave? It's scheduled so ridiculously early on the, on the morning. And we explained that because on this four-hour uh, journey, halfway on the journey, there's uh, one island where there's one family who lives there, and, uh, and, and their son needs to get to school. And the school is on the main island of Corpo. Um, so they, this, this ferry was scheduled for this one boy's school journey. And, um, and Alfredo was very touched by this story and the idea that there's still a place where there's like a, um, the whole infrastructure of the community is, is arranged kind of according to one person's needs. And, um, and so he decided to just uh, make his work for this boy. And, uh, and so he, we invited, together with him, we invited uh, Finnish intellectuals to write letters to Markus, to the boy. And these, these letters were printed on billboards and they were put along this, um, this his school journey, in a way. And, uh, and so these were along this very route. And then um, to um, other kind of approaches, um, Erlin Wikström is a Swedish artist who, who ended up working very closely with marine biologists. Um, they, um, they, he got, she got really interested in this, um, in this research that they were doing locally that had to do with seagrass, certain type of seagrass. Seagrass is actually a wrong term, but it's a kind of popular, understandable uh, name for this, this particular plant. And, uh, and she was really interested in how there's all this stuff that goes on at the sea bottom that we don't know anything about. And how um, also when we talk about the pollution of the sea, it's usually the visible things. It's the uh, algae and, and so on that we focus on. And, and apparently, um, she learned that this seagrass is something that is really fast disappearing from across the globe for all kinds of reasons of human intervention, usually, on coastal areas. And this is really crucial plant as a, a for m many reasons. One, um, that it's, it's a sort of nursery uh, for a lot of, um, a lot of um, little sort of sea creatures, animals. Um, but also, it's a, it's a carbon sink. It's one of the crucial, it's a hugely important carbon sink in a global scale. It's like the trees, you know, but in the, in the sea. And, um, and so she worked with the, uh, with the marine biologists and they developed an experiment on, on replanting, so transplanting this uh, sea crust to a new location. And they are going to be documenting that for three years to see if, um, how it survives and if this kind of transplanting can actually be one way of kind of restoring damaged um, areas. And, um, and alongside this, you know, so she got people involved in, in, in this transplanting process. Uh, she's, she was there involved in, you know, she's going to be going there and monitoring together with the, with the scientists. And, um, and then there was also on a kind of on a visible sort of above the surface level, um, we arranged with her this, this plant swap where, where people sent, uh, gave us uh, cuttings of house plants and we kind of transplanted these cuttings, and, and now they will be given, uh, they're given to adoption, um, and so they're kind of, they, they end up staying as these kind of symbols of, of what goes on invisibly underground. And these adopters of these plants, new plants, will become like ambassadors for the seagrass as well in this process. And this was interesting because the marine biologists had read, the local marine biologists had kind of been really engaged in doing all this research with seagrass for a long time, and, uh, and, and they knew that this kind of experiment had been done elsewhere, but they had never done the experiment themselves because it just hadn't kind of happened. And so it was interesting how an art project could actually produce a, a kind of a, a scientific experiment in itself. Um, Rax Media Collective, um, when they came first to, um, to see the site, like a year before the exhibition, uh, Monica, who came from that, um, Monica Narola, was asking many times of like, why do you call this a sea because it's not salty enough? So finally, we, we met loads of people and, and you know, finally this one um, researcher in the Archipelago Research Institute, uh, who's, a, who's a biologist, he said, oh yeah, it's, it's not a sea, you know, it's actually brackish water, so it's like a large river estuary of a many rivers uh, in Scandinavia and also from, you know, in the southern Baltic. And, um, and so this kind of low salinity, a very particular salinity level, became the kind of clue to their work. This idea that they, they found out that actually there's, um, there's slightly more salt in our tears than in, in the Baltic Sea. And, and this idea that if, if 
now with the climate change, it can go either way. That if, if there's more rainfall, the, the salinity will get lower and lower, and the kind of the, it will totally destroy the very kind of unique uh, ecosystem that is between the kind of marine and freshwater ecosystem. Uh, the other option is that if the sea levels rise so much that the North Sea will, will feed more salt, salty water in the Baltic Sea, that the same kind of you know, process will happen, but the other way. So, that, um, so the ecosystem is really on the kind of fine line you know, now of what's going to happen to it. And so they uh, made a big piece, um, like a mirror, mirror of the sea's thought, as they said, um, that was uh, floated in the sea along this sort of quite a busy um, sort of marine route where big, big sort of uh, ships um, go past it, as you can see, big cruise ships. They're obviously part of the ecological problem as well of this area, um, go through it on a daily basis. Another uh, Finnish artist, not locally based, but a Finnish artist who's uh, um, uh, he, she got involved in, uh, uh, in really thinking about what we eat and how, um, how the choices, the kind of food choices, affect the landscape. And she worked closely with restaurants, with local restaurants, to produce kind of uh, landscape-friendly options for their menus. And, uh, and this was a lot more complicated project <laughs> than she thought. She thought that this is kind of, you know, that this is straightforward enough. You know, we need to eat certain type of fish. We need to eat, like, organic and so on. And she found it extreme. She, she spent days, weeks talking with these restaurants and coming across these kind of hurdles of, okay, so is it, you know, is it too complicated? How can we do this? Or oh, we can't get this fish, or we can't get these potatoes. And, and, um, and you know, isn't local, local good enough? And then local often was actually a new potatoes that are pumped full of fertilizers, you know, whatever, you know, the ground. And, and this idea of what is uh, the local is good, you know, which of course is not always the case. Um, so, but in the end, they produced absolutely fantastic meals in, in five different restaurants, very different kinds of restaurants, some very locally, you know, based like a pub, and then, you know, sort of quite a fancy restaurant. And, uh, and this project will continue, that the restaurants have all wanted to continue with Aria this, this year. And, uh, and also the project is growing into kind of, there's going to be an event in Helsinki around, particularly the kind of, um, the notion of trash fish. But there's this fish that has become like a problem when the, um, when the sea and the waters, also the lakes, have become like kind of um, too nutrient rich now. And, and, and so, um, so she's been really studying this kind of, you know, how, how certain fish we, that we used to eat 20 years ago, now it's considered trash fish. You know, nobody's eating it, but it's turned into a problem. And, and kind of how do, you, how do you kind of create new, new local uh, traditional you know, food in a way? How do you kind of, you know, renew maybe a tradition so that they actually, and, and, and kind of invent local anew so that it actually really corresponds to the kind of contemporary environmental kind of situation. There's the, you know, sheep. You'll see more sheep soon. Um, there's a, um, there's a, these two uh, Helsinki-based artists work to, uh, Teller and Oliver work together with Swedish filmmaker Henrik Andersson to produce archipelago science fiction. The starting point was they invited local people involved in the project of visioning uh, what is the archipelago like in 100 years' time. Uh, these are totally hilarious, these short films. So they worked together with workshops, creating the scripts, and then the locals were also acting. Um, they um, found a lot of bearded men, for example, for one of the scenes. Um, that brought in a lot of questions about, you know, future that are relevant, of course, way beyond these particular aisles. They also had a, a local, local um, animation filmmaker, Antonia Ringbung, was involved in the project and, and created these sort of animations for the beginning of, for, for, for this, for the kind of beginning of each scene of their film. And uh, as well as Antonia also made um, her own film for the project. Then a couple more, um, and then we'll move on. Uh, Minerva Cuevas, Mexico, um, she made an independent uh, mobile network for one island. So it was kind of a non-commercial, um, open source, software-based um, technology using NAT and create this sort of open hut. This is actually an, sort of an outdoor loo that has been turned into a kind of, um, where well, it's never been used as a toilet, but, you know, used as a kind of very uh, recognizable form in Finland. 
and, and turn this into a, um, a sort of a, a base where this um, mobile network was operating from. And, um, and this is the same system that, for example, in Haiti was used after the earthquake before the commercial operators could get their systems working. This was used locally in hospitals and so on. So she's really looking at this, um, interested in, in how more, how this kind of, uh, how our basic infrastructures like um, phone um, connections and services, now that they've all become commercialized and, 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 and privately kind of um, operated, um, what happens in remote areas um, where people are very sparsely uh, living in wide areas, for example, remotely, uh, that the you know these this, um, big operators, commercial operators, they, they have absolutely no incentive to build or to develop systems in these sorts of areas. And this is, of course, relevant to a place like like Turku Archipelago, where there's very few people anymore. Uh, it's still well connected now, uh, but the idea of actually being able to uh, take control of these sort of basic infrastructures and actually for the community, it's 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 a very very interesting. Um, sort of thought and might be relevant one day. Uh, who knows? And then one more. There was one work that was mobile, uh, literally. Uh, this is Thea Makiba's um, project, Northbound. It's a, um, it's a boat that had a load of animals, stuffed animals, traveling around the islands. And, uh, and it was this sort of um, like an animal rescue boat. Northbound referring to the fact that when the, with the climate change, the erosion and, uh, and other ecological changes that are happening, uh, there will be more and more movement northbound, that more and more the kind of the further southern areas are becoming uninhabitable slowly and both animals and, and humans will have to find new territories to live in. Um, so Quickly, a couple of kind of points about sustainability, and then I want to kind of just leave leave that more for the discussion between the with us, with me and the artist. Um, but uh, what do I mean in terms of sustainability then, and how do I, you know, I'm kind of critically reflecting back now what we did and trying to kind of understand that further maybe now in those particular terms, and uh, and going back to the kind of three ecologies of Felix Gotaris. Um, I think in, in terms of to understand how this, this kind of an art project, for example, works, uh, we have to think beyond like carbon footprints. Um, we have to kind of think about environmental impact, of course, but also social and subjective impacts of what, what happen in these processes. What kinds of kind of lasting connections are created? Um, one of them being the concrete example that I'm here now, which is obviously not very sustainable in carbon footprint terms, you know, flying from Helsinki. But the fact that, you know, this is either something is continuing, that these kinds of collaborations and, and, and production of knowledge and understanding is continuing in different ways. Um, what is sustainable in terms of individual practices? That is the question that I'd like to ask from Rene and Nomeda and Kediminas. You know, what is, you know, involved in a project like this? What is, how... How can that be considered? Uh, what makes would make it sustainable for you um, as, a, as an artist, as a practitioner? And what does the exhibition leave behind locally? It's, of course, an important question. Uh, but also, what does it allow beyond this kind of temporal and spatial frame? So um, what continues locally, but also what continues elsewhere? And how the, how the work continues or how the work travels and makes other connections beyond this particular exhibition. Um, here, the kind of, um, what I think, what, what sort of emerged in the process of the exhibition, that was not something kind of, it wasn't kind of pre-thematized, you know, I didn't have a theme of, of kind of, for example, the kind of future of the islands, or future of the archipelago, but that really emerged from the artist approaches and their, their projects. And, uh, and has made me think more about this sort of future orientation of art practice. Um, and particularly in, in sort of terms of sustainability, uh, Rosie Pridotti, a philosopher, has written about the present. That the present is always a future present. If it's not, then we don't have a future. Um, and this kind of possibly thinking in, in terms of our practice, we need to think about alternatives to the kind of consumerist and also the sort of investment logic. Uh, I was at the Armory show a few days ago, so that's why the investment thought is kind of 
has been quite powerfully implanted in my head. Uh, but what is other kind of future orientation that is not built on, 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 on this kind of logic? Um, the, of course, the kind of quite classic notion of the imagination, the power of imagination. And I think both in, in, in the Urbanasis and, and René's practice, there's this, this idea of projection of, of futurity of some kind. The, power, you know, the possibility to imagine worlds into being. Um, and here the focus is on the means and not on the ends. And that is a really crucial thing here. I'd like to end there and, uh, and pass on to Numera and Kediminas. I have no idea how long I've thought. I was probably meant to talk a lot less than now, but you know, never mind. <laughs> we'll be here probably a bit late, <laughs> like we were talking before. Okay, so I'll just move back and, uh, and it's probably best if I sit there so I can listen to your presentation as well. Okay. Mm. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Taro, for a fantastic talk. Uh, you probably said almost everything, so mm, we have to now think, you know, <laughs> what to add, and maybe just quickly go for our project and point some like key issues, you know. Uh, our project is called Utopia. And uh, as you see, it has like two parts. Uta, as Star already introduced, this most remote island of Archipelago. And Pia, the name of Finnish name for of woman who has four sheep and whom we were considering for our experiment for the project. Okay, but uh, let's start from the island. What is the island? German philosopher Sloterdijk uh, has concept of the island he has described in his theory of the spheres. Maybe we can talk about it later. Um, Carlo Bozualdo mentions uh, in topological gardens when he is uh, writing about Bruce Nauman who has a long term fascination with telephone booths. Inside of them, you are both exposed and secluded in the space of your own that doesn't protect you from being on exhibit. Paradoxical entanglement that best could be expressed using language of topology. Is the island most remote place? Is there a place on the island that can be remote out of the range of the radar, not reachable by the networks. Islands are natural barriers employed by the infrastructure of war. Their landscape and the waters in between are deployed and to construct lines of defense and deception. To take over the control of the landscape and vistas, places to hide and to observe. Today, the uh, Finnish army is leaving the islands because of the development of technologies. And as it possible to conduct missions remotely, but um, there is still a question, uh, what to do with the army? In one of the islands that is called Korpu, there is a telegraph hill. In the 60s, uh, after the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, two superpowers um, agreed to uh, create a direct line between the Washington and Moscow. 
as uh, during the crisis, it took U.S. nearly 12 hours to receive and decode Nikita Khrushchev's 3,000 word initial settlement message, dangerously long time in the chronology of nuclear brinkmanship. By the time the U.S. had drafted a reply, a tougher message from Moscow has been received demanding the U.S. missiles to be removed from Turkey. Telegraph Hill uh, and the bunker there that is hosting all the infrastructure to guarantee that uh, direct line between Moscow and uh, Washington uh, after the end of the Cold War has been in the possession of the local telecommunication company but kept in the secret and still maintained with all the functions as a bunker with ventilation, electricity, um, heating system, you may ask why. For the future wars? No. That's, that's a condition how uh, these uh, places, those remote places uh, should be maintained in order not to create any uh, any dangerous condition for the humans who are inspecting them. And the red, red telephone. This is all that how we found all this place, visiting it. And no knowledge uh, was obviously accessible uh, in the, in the cities, in, the, in all these villages uh, when we first visited, because uh, this, this was a top secret during the old Cold War times. But somehow there were, uh, there were a few memories still remaining. And for us to access these memories, to access these sediments, uh, to access uh, these hidden uh, curves in the landscape was uh, a starting point. The biosphere. The water is functioning as a recording device uh, and the sea with all this sediment and the seabed, as Taro mentioned, uh, that has, well, become a large repository of memories, stories that capture human history of interventions. And uh, the history of the Baltic Sea remembers uh, the, after the Second World War time, where, when the all uh, repository of the chemical weapons uh, were buried at the bottom of the sea, creating huge territories of the dead seabeds. And uh, then, of course, there is a history of industry and industrial agriculture after Second World War, and telecommunication networks, which are laid on the bo bottom of the Baltic Sea, also gas and oil pipelines, recent gas prom pipe, pipeline. And uh, when we think about the concept of, of the biosphere is not only to preserve the nature, but also to think how the human activities can be leveraged. And the meadows uh, that become a buzzword at the moment when speaking about archipelago uh, and its place on the island where the ecosystematic balance can be re-established. Uh, the historical landscape where the sheep used to graze was altered with industrialization of farming on the one side and also on the other with collectivization and massive production of agriculture. So nowadays uh, across the Europe uh, there are European Union supported programs that encourage taking sheep and other animal, but sheep in particular, back to the meadows as a technology to leverage the, this balanced biosphere. So they have this twofold function, the beautification of the landscape and also the technology to reestablish the balance. And there are several hundreds of sheep, maybe thousands, on these islands. Um, and uh, probably thousands in Finland, we didn't count it, uh, how many precisely, but, uh, but there is no diary tradition uh, 
to remain. And uh, sheep are mostly raised for the meat, not even wool, because uh, cutting takes uh, a lot of effort, uh, and it doesn't uh, give uh, big revenue. Uh, but we were interested uh, in the milking process as a process uh, that allows uh, us to physically regain, uh, retain, and also regain the link that may, might be lost with the nature. And we came with the proposal that maybe uh, the army should not leave the meadows, but rather learn milking, and through that, come back to the civilian life. So the milking, uh, sheep milking, is a lost tradition in the northern part of Europe. And uh, once it, it has you know, sustained, but it's no longer there. Uh, and uh, with the EU legis legislation, the new members of European Union, they have quotas on many things, including the number of sheep. Some countries signing the agreement agree that you know they would they would have ten thousand you know or fifteen thousand million sheep. Some of them had re-registered sheep as goats to bypass the legislation. <laughs> the tradition is no longer there on the islands, so we started to look uh, at the uh, diary sheep farmers around the Baltic Sea. As the rivers fall into the into the sea, so um, so these different farms um, we visited uh, on the way to the to the archipelago, and we found two sheep farmers in Lithuania, no sheep farmers in Latvia, one sheep farmer in Estonia, who would milk none in Finland, and the only one in a neighborhood uh, archipelago that is called Oland Archipelago, which is autonomous territory in Finland. Um, and uh, five in Sweden, uh, several in the northern uh, Germany, and uh, also few in Poland. Very few, actually. So 
So in Holland Islands, we met with Cecilia Skimbra, um, who uh, she developed. Uh, she she actually she moved there without any knowledge of the sheep farming. Um, she founded uh, some uh, abandoned uh, cow farm, which she refurbished uh, and re-engineered into the uh, sheep farming, into the sheep, uh, dairy sheep farming. And uh, she developed her recipe of the cheese making, and especially the one with the clover. Uh, and we invited her to be uh, our partner and uh, a leader of the first Baltic sheep cheese workshop. To make a special recipe for the Archipelago project, um, that would work with taste and with the color, and also to elaborate addition of the cheese for the project as a tang tan tangible evidence of the research, and share her knowledge of the cheese making with local farmers in Archipelago. But as the summers come late in Finland um, and the season of milking starts, starts much later, we could not produce milk for the opening. So we had to travel and visit all these farmers around the Baltic Sea to gather the required amount of milk for the cheese production. And we had to smuggle this cheese for the workshop <laughs> in the frozen form uh, we had a refrigerator on board, so we collected these bits and brought it on the, on the boat to the island. And we got access to the local uh, school kitchen where uh, pupils learning how to cook and invited local farmers who uh, have sheep, but they never had experience uh, of milking and producing uh, any products from milk, from the sheep milk. One person who joined the workshop was actually uh, saying that he's not that much interested in making uh, sheep milk cheese, but he's interested in making sheep milk ice cream. And of course, to understand the process and the recipe, uh, there are a lot of secrets. Uh, you work with bacteria, you work with uh, rennet, you work with isams, you work with fungi. And uh, as the blue rock for requires to be ripened in the caves in south of France, we suggested that military bunkers can be transformed in the cheese cellars. In that way, we could change, we could offer a program to change that landscape. Without army leaving, of course, because we need army to milk the sheep. So we need bunkers, we need army, and also we have meadows that have all these uh, fantastic uh, herbs, which suggest different tastes to the cheese, in this case, spreadable. And during the several visits to the islands, we met people whose stories helped us to formulate initial ideas around this research. Kai, who is a retired engineer who built telecommunication infrastructures and secured important dialogues on the hotline during the years of the Cold War. Katya, biologist, who speaks about meadows and biosphere so passionately, so we got really interested in these concepts and uh, thinking about them in terms of our project. Merit, who is a small-scale farmer living on the islands, organic farmer, as she says, uh, to talk about her relationship to the animal. She has few sheep, she's not milking them yet, but she was facilitating this workshop and helping to organize all other farmers, and she's considering milking them. And we use the duration of the exhibition uh, 
for the cheese to mature. So we had the workshop of making the cheese at the opening, and at the finissage, we had uh, a tasting of the cheese that was maturing, that was using uh, the bunker as its space for maturing. So we organized the tour uh, that was um, facilitated by these three persons who we met and whose thinking about the place and the relationship to the environment and the relationship to the history of that contested space was extremely important for us. So, in a way, we, we found it, this most remote place um, on the island, and at the same time, the place that, that is most probably connected on the island. So this topological paradox, this is something that was very important in this project. And probably, uh, also it allows us uh, to speak about some techniques and the uh, technique of the unwar is one of those that we're interested. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I, I sort of feel like I should be sitting the other direction to look at the screen. But um, I'm, not, I'm not going to uh, give you a, a clear narrative uh, of the project. I just want to um, mention a couple of the points uh, that were raised uh, in relation to, well, thinking about the project and some of the ideas that uh, arose uh, in the course of it, as well as uh, some of the questions that have come out. And then I'd like to show you um, a couple of clips from an existing film. But um, some of the things that Taru asked, um, I want to refer to. Um, what I'm showing you uh, in terms of this slideshow is the process uh, or kind of representation of aspects of the process from uh, a number of different perspectives, uh, all of them ones that are related to uh, where I've been during the time of working on the process, uh, from living to working, uh, and um, yeah, these are these are all kind of um, mesh in the work. Um, and Taru asked um, a question about, um, well, what is it that we would we do um, in relation to the work, or how does the work actually survive, um, uh, or what's the relationship between, um, say, um, notions of sustainability uh, and duration in terms of work. Uh, and I think that um, really thinking about all the processes that are involved in being able to ever make anything is a part of that. Uh, and then uh, in terms of what it is that I imagine my uh, relationship to this project could be, um, it had a lot to do with um, actually thinking of producing uh, something specific. Uh, and in this case, it's a film. Uh, and for me, that's one of the ways that I, I um, like to engage with um, the whole thinking process around um, uh, approaching a site uh, Taro mentioned uh, a kind of uh, relationship to site 
uh, that I've been engaged with over a number of years uh, and also mentioned the notion of system, like system specific, which is actually um, uh, a, a notion that uh, Stephen Prina, who was a guest last week, uh, and I had discussed together quite a while ago. <laughs> Uh, and thinking about the system as something that can travel and then a film itself as being a kind of a system, uh, a form of that, uh, a kind of deliberate uh, organization of uh, materials that can actually travel or that are portable. Um, sim um, a film or a book, uh, as, as Alfredo uh, Jarre produced, is also something that it's possible uh, to, to encounter at another time or in another place. Uh, and so given these ideas uh, in terms of approaching, thinking about the project, um, I, I felt uh, able to, to go to uh, the Finnish archipelago uh, and, and to uh, continue engaging with it and thinking about it, but also um, well, to just go back a bit, Taro actually first um, approached me uh, in 2009 uh, at the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich in England, um, where um, I had an exhibition that was a commission um, that I had produced. And during the time of working on that commission, I'd been uh, thinking quite a bit about islands. And um, I believe I've... It's, I guess it was in 2007 when I first received the commission. So I'd been thinking about islands, and I was also thinking about islands in relationship to how people inhabit them. Uh, and that uh, there's often a difference between the way islands are uh, actually inhabited by people uh, and the way in which uh, there's a, there are projections placed upon islands. Um, imagining them to be some kind of an ideal location. But then I thought a lot more about it and thought about my own relationship to islands and thought about how I actually lived on an island, um, which was Manhattan Island. Uh, and also I was living in an archipelagic uh, region, uh, which is um, the San Francisco Bay uh, area. Uh, and uh, this was also, you know, filled with a number of islands, with a number of flows between them and kind of quite long histories. Uh, and then the other island that I was thinking about was the island of Majorca, um, which is also a place that I have gone to um, uh, nearly yearly for over about a decade. And so those were kind of the locations I was thinking about. And I wanted to, rather than to think about what might be imagined would be the island that I would, the islands I might think about, I wanted to think about islands that it wouldn't necessarily be imagined that I would think about. Uh, and so in that sense, this project kind of fit really well into this ongoing uh, way of um, encountering and thinking and reflecting, uh, and also um, sort of fed into um, developing a new film, uh, which is still in process. But one of the things that I really um, uh, respected about um, this project, and I have to say that's one of the, it's often not easy to use that word uh, in relationship to um, projects that uh, artists are invited to, that you actually respect um, the process and uh, the way that things are being done but that um, it was very interesting to be given an opportunity to actually continue to develop ideas uh, that uh, were not even uh, yet fixed, uh, that there was a kind of openness, and there continues to be uh, in terms of this project, uh, to actually uh, very uh, genuinely be, seem to be interested in um, notions of sustainability but sustainability meaning something that um, exceeds uh, even the environmental aspect of it uh, and think uh, to be able to actually think about um, what can be sustained uh, in terms of thinking or between people uh, in particular places uh, and also between locations as well. 
Uh, and then, um, you know, a number of different things kind of opened up in the process of thinking about these things. Uh, and so um, you've seen also, you know, some indications of some of the actual projects that were produced. Uh, and uh, I think that, I mean, in my relationship to it really has very much to do with the kind of ongoingness of the project uh, and this sort of uh, more open-ended aspect of what could be possible. And so this is a huge challenge, I think, in terms of um, approaching uh, something that would be described to the public as an exhibition. Uh, and the dysfunctional aspect uh, has to do with it being something that is really in contradiction to the notion of um, you know, an exhibition. Uh, but um, the kind of time uh, related uh, and also geographical parts that have to do with like actually cir circulating between locations and uh, kind of slowly approaching them and things like that and kind of a slowing down of time uh, that has taken place in developing this work uh, has been a, a very um, like profoundly interesting. So um, let's see, where are we now? <laughs> okay. Um, Actually, I would like to have a bit of time to be able to have some kind of a discussion between all of us to talk about some of these ideas. Um, and I think the slideshow, I'm not really sure how long it goes on. It's actually quite open-ended, like the project. Um, but uh, I'd like to show um, a couple of clips that were related to kind of like the instigatory aspect of working on the project. Um, Taru showed you some images uh, of the location of Uto, which is the most distant um, of the, the islands in that um, archipelago. And that was the site that I focused on um, in terms of filming, um, I, mean, I mean, and also spending the most time on the, the, this particular location. Uh, and so it was visited uh, in every season uh, throughout the year, and um, it's something that, uh, the, the whole idea of duration and trying to examine how, what's there, um, <laughs> became a part of it. But um, there's always a question in terms of um, traveling and making work uh, that relates to different locations. Um, there's always a question about well, where are you in that work, or what's your relationship to it? Um, and does it become a travel log, or is it something else? And I, I think it is something else, uh, in, especially when uh, what takes place is actually uh, something that you, you understand is not going to be encompassed uh, in the time that you, you visit a location, and that also with repeated um, uh, visits to it, uh, things change in terms of your relationship to location. So um, I think I'll just stop now <laughs> and then show these two clips, uh, which are from a, a film, the film that actually Taro saw it uh, in uh, 2009. That's when it was produced. It's called Endless Dreams in Water Between. It's actually a feature film, but um, I'll show you two short clips uh, to give you an indication of it. Here are some initial thoughts I've written regarding the September Institute. These are up for discussion, so I look forward to your feedback. I listed four mottos. One, we still own our words and can produce them. Two, anything you create, you want to exist, and its means of existence is in being printed. Three, Sending transmissions from dispersed islands, linking worlds, time, and space. Four, we continue the ongoing movement of combination people. September Institute compiles and regenerates material from abandoned collections and publications, providing indexical access and linked research tools that enable circulation within the depths of significant ideas operations and productions of those who may have been forcefully forgotten. SI publishes out-of-print books to give them new life. 
September Institute is not a utopian community, but rather a momentary nexus. It exists in contrast to previous idealist attempts to address shifting contemporary moments. Acknowledging the predilections of the past, idealist, romantic, utopian, and modernist aims, SI embraces the present, however it is calibrated, in relation to time with a consciousness of time's expanse. Beautiful and odd remnants from the expanse of time are excavated, represented, and rethought. These include books, ephemera, notebooks, photos, and out-of-date, time-based formats, i.e. pre-digital. There are evidence of encounters, a trace of experience, SI produces books of collected data. Online versions also exist. Please let's continue thinking and exchanging. I love words, etymologically, textually. It's possible to enter words on one's own, as each of us can enter the letters we've exchanged on our own. Examining each other's thoughts separately, this process of exchanging and learning about each other's thoughts through letters is a bit like learning about words. Becoming familiar with the vast range of nuances possible, of words and thoughts, is like entering a secret or monastic order. Very few people care about words or thoughts in this way. It's the way things are. I find comfort in this exploration, though, perhaps because it's specialized rather than standardized knowledge, which is so abundant. How to translate past feelings, times, and histories into meaningful comprehension that can provide fuel amidst present feelings of lack and absence. Was it always this way? I wonder about life before our presumed extreme technological connectivity and presumed availability. I wonder how you feel and how others have felt. Probing these things has motivated this correspondence. The wish for something else that might be possible, more profound understanding, for example, other kinds of meaning. I do care about depth and varieties of meanings as I care about combinations and permutations, as we've discussed. Autodidacticism can be extremely fulfilling, especially when so much can appear to be a wasteland. This doesn't mean that I'm interested in retreating but rather I feel my senses available to engage are sharpened as I can choose a more exact way of articulating or conveying them in words, images, sounds, etc. I respect and admire each of you for also sharing these interests. Since so many specialized skills, things, and people are slipping into oblivion, my interest is more and more in what is specific and perhaps thought of as esoteric. What is determinedly unfashionable, this interests me. Maybe some things are too difficult to reproduce because there is no facility, concentration, or interest that enables easy reproduction. I'm not endorsing craft, as it's recently been labeled. This is not my interest. I'm also not suggesting difficulty for the sake of difficulty, nor am I assuming that specialty can be equated with superiority Yet still, I wish to probe life's complexity. And I'm glad that each of you is also willing to do this. I'll conclude my letter with something to ponder as it relates to what I've written. We can wander with Henri Bergson and Gilles Deleuze. Why something rather than nothing? But why this rather than something else? Why this tension of duration? Why this speed rather than another? Why this proportion? And why will a perception evoke a given memory or pick up certain frequencies rather than others? In other words, being is difference and not the immovable or the undifferentiated, nor is it contradiction, which is merely false movement. Being is the difference itself of the thing, what Bergson often calls the nuance. I'll leave you with those words until the next time. From each of our islands, let's stare at the moon. Yours, Aria.
what we uh, plan to do with the talk. So uh, I think we'll, what we could do is that we'll just open it out if you have any questions, and then we'll kind of start off the conversation in, you know, in that way, if that's OK. Um, so I don't wonder if anybody wants to open up the conversation. There's a mic. Maybe a technical question, but mm -hmm. I'm still trying to understand uh, the time frame of the project. Okay. Um, because it's not really an exhibition, is it? I'm sorry? It's not just an exhibition. It's no. something else. No. So where in this, did the process begin with what you're calling the exhibition? No. Um, or, <laughs> or was that um, part of a of the process, or was that the end of the process that you can't yeah. stop yeah. working on now? That will probably go on for a while. Or sort of, what what is it? Yeah. What, where where are yeah. you in this yeah. process that you're referring I'm to as the exhibition? I'm glad you know? that you're asking because I kind of didn't make you know any. I, I guess I've kind of got so detached from the idea of the exhibition already that I kind of forgot to tell you you know what it was <laughs> you know when and where. Um, it was um, last summer. The exhibition was last summer, 2011. And, uh, and so we, it was kind of a, I guess it was sort of the goal to work towards, but it ended up kind of losing the function in the process. Uh, and, but it's still officially, of course, that was the kind of the product, you know, that, you know, that was part of the cultural capital year. And so, um, so the exhibition happened. Some of the work was part of the exhibition, and some work happened in the process during the exhibition, and some work never made it to the exhibition. Uh, but has a, you know, has, you know, will be tangible or has been, you know, printed, for example, in, in, in another context. Um, so yeah, so that was kind of, and, and two years, two years before that, um, some of the artists started working. So it was over between the kind of year or two year processes for each artist working on the producing work that in some form or another or did or did not end up in the exhibition. <laughs> so exhibition as an excuse, maybe, you know, the exhibition as a kind of, you know, allowed, you know, producing an exhibition allowed us to do what we did, but the exhibition itself did not become the kind of uh, an end product as such. So I don't know if that, that sounded pretty um, vague. But, you, know. <laughs> you mentioned that um, Alfredo Yar showing up and saying, who's the audience for this? And I was just, for the, just kind of a question for the artist there, like how... What was your thought process around what the audience is for working in this very, you know, this kind of landscape and working in this way? Yeah, should I say that? Okay. Um, th thanks for asking that. Um, it was it was an it was interesting because um, it was sort of in the process of uh, spending time on the, in these different locations, you realized that the audience might be really small. Um, and that was actually okay. It didn't really, it, it seemed fine uh, that actually maybe, I mean, on that island of Uto, there were what, like 36 people? Mm. <laughs> and, uh, but the thing is that um, the intensity of the encounter uh, could be very different. Um, and also because of the distance, um, to actually get to a location, if you'd spent um, five hours in a boat going from already, you know, this was from Corpo. If you took the boat, uh, and that was the largest, uh, that was a larger island that we were kind of based on. And so to go from there to Uto was like about five hours and even longer uh, in the winter through the ice, kind of like the ice road. <laughs> Um, and, and so if anybody actually did go there, um, the kind of experience that they had was, was something very particular. And it was, re it was also related to the whole process of getting to it. Uh, and that was, that was somehow uh, related to the, all of the, the various projects. Uh, I mean, even the, the one, I can say, speak as a witness uh, to the one that uh, Ur Urbonuses did, that um, it was really, uh, quite uh, affecting uh, going into the bunker. Uh, and as, a, as you know, I, I wasn't able to stay in there um, because it was so intense, uh, the, you know, the, the whole experience and the residue uh, of the mold and everything. It was a very, very visceral uh, experience. And so 
the audience was a combination, I think. It was um, of, of people who lived in the place, in the various places, uh, and also um, people who came externally and, and, and came on, the, on boats to go to see it. Uh, and then as, as um, uh, Taru was showing these various projects, you could see them from some of the ferry boats uh, that you would take to go between the different islands. And, but, you know, I mean, this is also kind of a question, too, about like to what degree do you, do you encounter them or you see them? Can you read those letters um, to Marcus mm -hmm. from the billboard? Or, <laughs> you yeah. know, how is it? And we heard a lot of comments because of going there um, several times, uh, so before the exhibition or you know, in, in whatever state it was in uh, took place and then after and during. Uh, and yeah, local people were also asking questions about, well, what, you know, what's this? Or, you know, wondering about different things. But um, yeah, I think it's, it's a kind of, uh, it's still, still going on, like trying to figure out like who, who are the audience. But I think it's also shifting somehow what that can even mean um, now. <laughs> I think in our case, uh, we had like different ideas about the audience <laughs> from the beginning <laughs> till the end, because the project itself was like shaped by you know unexpected encounters, unexpected you know difficulties, seasons, whatever you know. <laughs> so in a way. At some point, we always try to make participants of our projects, our audience, first of all. So I think they were like our main audience. And ideally, probably everybody, like every visitor of the island would probably also be an audience who would go to the shop and, let's say, buy the cheese which we produced, or would, would have produced. But since this didn't happen, so then we had like a very particular audience for the last performance, which was, you know, those who attended the sem symposium or seminar. But yeah, that's kind of my idea of the audience. Yeah, just, just to add one sentence that uh, for me, the audience was mapped in this map. Two in Lithuania, none in Latvia, one in Estonia, none in Finland, mm -hmm. and one in Holland Islands. Mm. <laughs> I guess um, also, you know, the sort of, um, it's like what a uh, this sort of project where you'd never know who your audience is afterwards either, because you never know who's seen the work, you know, or what they've thought about it. And, and we were asked already before, we were asked by, the, I, I talked to this uh, museum, kind of whatever, in European museum organization people, and they were like, okay, so how are you gonna evaluate this? You know, are you gonna, why don't you hand out some forms on some of the ferries to people? You know, it's just like, then it really made me think of how we really have to kind of critically think and articulate why this kind of audience response and feedback is not a right way to evaluate a project like this. Um, but it was kind of, you know, just a little, of course, we've heard a lot, you know, we've heard like interesting things like uh, with that, uh, because we were hanging around there for so long that I, after a while, the kind of after two years, the locals said, okay, these two women, you know, me and my colleague Lotta, that they must be pretty serious because they're still around, you know, <laughs> <laughs> coming and going all the time, <laughs> and with different people, and, um, and, and, and so we've, we've heard things, you know, and like in, in all the... Um, your your um, work, it was kind of amazing because Uta has only up to about 40 people in the winter, but they're going to be up to 500 people on the island in the summer days. And, uh, and, and it's, so it's kind of gets really busy, you know, it's like the size of this room with no trees, you know, and you're suddenly, you know, there's 500 people there. And, and so this kind of, this, this work became like a sort of refuge, you know, sort of moment to kind of uh, slow down, you know, and you're in this sort of totally peripheral location. And, and then you have to kind of escape, you know, from the people. And, uh, and, and so, it, it, you know, I heard a lot of really positive things about that, kind of how it offered this sort of a different kind of a space where you also, you know, that kind of idea of an island that becomes quite claustrophobic, you know, when there's a lot of people there. And this idea that you can escape, you know, to other islands in a way through the work, you know, and through the kind of face, 
but also here the kind of the the uh, tempo, the rhythm was was a key in a way to allowing you to kind of get somewhere else. And uh, and then with the with the bunker, it was amazing how we had you know there was a symposium participants who came to the bunker, but also there were a number of local people involved who had been involved in different ways in the process, and we invited them too. And uh, it was a real revelation. There's a lot of people who lived around there and who kind of, a lot of people had heard these kind of myths about this place, but you know nobody had ever been there. And it was really quite sort of you know amazing experience for for the people who who lived right next to it and and who possibly had generations of roots in that island, you know, to kind of gain access to somewhere that, you know, has been kind of, you know, it, it's just sort of haunted in a way, that, that community for a long time. Hi, um, I should start out by saying that I'm from Canada and uh, I've been to many, many little islands and um, spent quite a bit of time in very remote communities. And I think the audience if I can maybe just quickly comment, uh, I think the audience for this kind of work is actually enormous. Uh, but, uh, and, and this is actually one of the most special things that I realized as I was watching your presentations is that the work itself, by highlighting the remoteness and the specialization, the highly, highly specialized um, information, I guess you could call it, uh, that actually highlights the fact that the audience is extremely difficult to access. And, and, and that on its own is, um, I, I mean, I come from a very technical background, so I see that as a, a technical shortcoming of humanity, that it's extremely difficult to find this information, explore it, find funding for it, for that matter, I imagine. And once that information is discovered and found, the ability to disseminate it to this highly specialized audience is also very difficult, which again, in my mind, makes it worthwhile in its own right. Um, but the second thing, the thing I really want to ask, the question I have, is um, given this wealth of information that you've discovered, has this led or inspired you for new works that are seemingly at face value very different from what you've been doing? Um, if I just say really briefly from a curator's point of view, it's definitely an ongoing process. I, I feel that only now I've had time to, and, and I've, I've been able to start critically reflecting because it was so intense. You know, there was a, like two of us doing this whole project, you know, so, you know, we were like, you know, this sort of quite a strange phenomenon on the islands where I think pace is usually quite slow and we were not slow, you know, most of the time for two years. Uh, but definitely, I think it's it's sort of really deeply affected of how I think about you know my practice as a curator, and and what I would want to do and how to do things. You know, so very complex. I couldn't put it in more concrete ways yet. Um, yeah, just just to try to briefly address that. Um, yes, I, I would say that it's been very affecting in terms of thinking about ways of doing things um, and, and the work that will be produced and that's in the process of being produced is, is, um, is definitely uh, shifting. Uh, and also, I guess, part of the, the extremity uh, of the, the experience um, in being in these various locations that were really um, very uh, isolated uh, in contrast to, uh, say, the same time that I was working on this, uh, I mean, I'm still working on it, but um, I also uh, spent a, a bit of time in Sao Paulo in Brazil, uh, and I was very uh, struck by um, the difference in, and was filming there also. And so, I mean, in terms of the way that this will actually somehow knit together into new work, um, I, I'm, I am pretty curious. I mean, it's affected it in different ways. Um, also because it's like in the process you start learning about different um, people uh, who are there uh, and also figures who are like important to place and like Tove Jensen and mm -hmm. thinking about the different ways of um, interpreting uh, the seasons with the islands and everything. and But there a number of different things that have come up that will be different, I, I would say, that I hadn't, hadn't done before. So, yeah. I'll just add really quickly to that. And I think the kind of key thing for me has been understanding and starting to think about sustainability in, in, in different ways. And 
trying to find my own kind of way into that problematic. And, uh, and I think coming really from that context, you know, this, under, this question of um, uh, preservation and conservation um, versus the kind of production. You know, what is, you know, how, how to go beyond that? You know, how, what is the kind of other alternative? Um, and, uh, and, and, and in terms of curatorial practice, in terms of art practice, um, I think that's been kind of really, you know, the, it's given me a lot of tools and kind of experience. Also, of course, things that I would do completely differently now than what I did a year or two ago. But kind of, and then maybe I could do something to add. Yes. Do you want to start? No, I think I think Tara read it. Yeah. Yeah, there, there, there was one question at least. That, oh, yeah, right? let's, yeah, let's take questions. I, I feel very weird to yeah. like, try to moderate at the same time uh, yeah. as contribute. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I was just trying to follow up like what um, was said here is like that thinking about exhibition and audience, I think it's also something very specific in the US or like in a bureaucratization, bureaucratization of the arts that there should always be an audience. Because I think it's really important to give also opportunities for artists to engage with something, even if there's maybe no audience. And I, I think it's really also interesting for curators to think about like what are forms of dissemination. Because I think it's equal interesting if you read something in a newspaper about something, you don't ne need to have seen it. Mm -hmm. it. It triggers you and it's inspiring you. And I think this one-to-one -one having seen something is not the only way to encounter something. So I think it's really this projects like that, um, the majority of people might just hear about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Or like here, like in a lecture, or they read about it, or there is a book. And I think mm -hmm. that is equally inspiring than seeing it directly. Mm -hmm. So, and I think to give space to artistic experiments, I think is equal important than to address audiences. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's really critical. Mm -hmm. And I think projects like that support this. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm really grateful to hear that and also a lot in the case of Rene or like you, to, to give the opportunity to develop new works for artists I think are equal critical and there's less and less opportunity for that. Mm -hmm. So I just want to say that and uh, applauding you and mm -hmm. doing such projects and I think events like cultural capitals or other projects that can have more funding than usually is there should exactly do that mm -hmm. rather than like supporting mm. the mm. expectations of bureaucrats. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, you know something, um, thank you for the comments. And I think there are more probably that uh, people would like to discuss. I, I, I know I would. Um, but uh, given the time constraints, which um, relate in part to this location and the way that the restaurants don't stay open very late, um, there's, uh, we uh, propose to continue this conversation at the Cambridge Brewery for those of you who are interested in joining us. Uh, and uh, yeah, we have to get over there quite quickly. Um, but thank you very much, um, Taru, and also Gedimita uh, Sinameda, for this very interesting uh, beginning of an ongoing conversation. So, um, and thanks everybody for coming and hope to see you. Thank you.